Good afternoon. Oh, that was loud. <laughs> uh, thank you for coming along this afternoon. I'm Katie Harrop, Professional Services Manager at Number 7, and I'm going to be talking to you this afternoon about myopia control. So we're going to cover a couple of things as we go along. Um, we're going to co cover why, why myopia matters. Uh, for any of you that were here yesterday uh, in the lectures, you'll ha have heard some of this information before, but I'll give you our slant on it. Uh, for low to moderate myopes in developed countries, I think we can assume that myopia is merely an inconvenience. Although I think even then we forget how much some of our patients really, really hate it. Even if they're minus three, they think it is the most disastrous thing in the world ever. And it's very easy for us to dismiss it if they're spectacle wearers or contact lens wearers as, as a problem solved. For myopes in developing countries, uncorrected myopia is a disability and it really can affect somebody's ability to survive in those environments. Um, if you're minus 10, your ability to function on a day-to-day -day basis without glasses or contact lenses is, is really impaired. And for high myopes the world over, the resultant complications of that myopia can lead to blindness. And we heard yesterday that the leading cause of blindness in Shanghai is myopic macular degeneration. So we really know that this is a significant problem. So we're going to have a little quiz, and I'm going to pick on you for answers. So we're going to guess the rates of myopia in all these countries, but the first thing you have to guess is what the country is. So, so can we guess what country this is? Because otherwise we're real in real trouble for the rest of it. Spain, <laughs> says Drew. <laughs> Could anybody give me a correct answer? Yes, thank you. The United States of America. So can, does anyone want to hazard a guess at the rate of myopia in the United States? 50%. Oh, Drew's doing pretty well there, we're at around 25%. So here's a very popular flag in Europe at the moment. Um, this is the European Union flag, I'm going to let you off that one. And in Europe, can anybody give me an idea of the rates that they think we're going to expect in Europe? Yeah, it's going to be pretty similar. Slightly higher at around 30%. So this is where the flag guessing gets more interesting. Can anybody guess this flag? This is an international conference. Indonesia. Oh, getting closer. This is the flag of Singapore. So, can anybody guess the rates of myopia? This is the rates of myopia in the adult population. Might be. Yeah, you're doing pretty well at this guessing. <laughs> Have you seen my slides before? We're at between, depending on the study, between 75 and 90% of people have myopia. The rates of significantly high myopia are obviously lower than that, but that's, a, that's an awful lot of people who are myopic. Now, if we compare that to my next one, and this is, this is the mean flag. Can anybody guess the, this flag? Nepal. Oh, nice one, Nick. It is Nepal. So when I first presented this, this uh, slide, I said, and of course, it's not a million miles away from Singapore. And then I had to think about my really terrible geography and work out whether it really was a million miles away from Singapore. It's clearly not. So can anybody guess the rates of myopia in Nepal? It's going to be over 90. It jumps from in Singapore at 75 to 90% all the way down to 2%. So we can see that there's some huge variation worldwide. Um, the problem of myopia in the Far East is, is a real public health problem, whereas in a country like Nepal, it really doesn't exist. So we've got to wonder why these differences occur. Is it genetics? Well, you can say, obviously, across the world, we're going to have genetic differences in the populations. But in the Far East, the increase, uh, increases in myopia myopia rates have jumped much quicker than generations, so we know that there isn't, it's not solely down to genetics. And uh, the, that's now being mirrored in Western countries, so in the developed countries we're also finding that we're jumping much higher, uh, higher rates. So is it lifestyle? I think um, for a long time we always assumed that it was going to be that if you spent a lot of time reading, then you were going to become more myopic. And recent research has shown that actually reading has a much less, uh, smaller effect than we ever thought it did. In fact, it's relatively insignificant. What we do know, however, is that there's an outdoor protective effect. So outdoor activity reduces the prevalence of myopia in children. And this has been repeated in many, many studies. So what it tells us is that we need to be chucking young children out in the garden and not keeping them inside. There's so a few important points to note about the protective effect. Firstly, that time outdoors doesn't equate to less reading. 
you can go and spend an absolutely ton of time outside and still go in and read a whole book and you're still going to get the protective effects of the outside so it's not negative reading time it's a, it's an effect all on its own and it doesn't need to be spent doing sports so it's not a benefit of an active lifestyle you don't have to be out there playing tennis you can be out there as a child bl blowing bubbles in the garden so it, it's literally just spending time outside uh, the time outdoors a protective effect is still effective when you have uh, myopic parents which obviously is useful for those worried myopic parents um, but once you're outside really that lim that effect is very limited once you are myopic sorry that effect it really becomes very limited so I think the advice that we need to be giving those those parents particularly of my uh, myopic parents to give their children is to get outside um, there's been a lot, a lot of research trying to work out whether it's a vitamin D issue or whether it's ambient light levels which actually slightly depresses me because it seems like then somebody would be wanting to give you a pill or p have a new light for inside wouldn't it just be much better if these children were actually outside so I, my children are currently out in the garden never allowed in <laughs> to myopic parents so what is myopia control it's the attempt to slow or halt the progression of myopia it's been attempted for many many years uh, RGP lenses under correction or bifocal lenses it was long believed that rigid lenses slow the progression of myopia, uh, but unfortunately a lot of that, uh, those reports were anecdotal or the studies weren't very well designed. And actually the current evidence shows that GP lenses on their own, just standard GP lenses, don't really have any controlling effect. Now under correction is an interesting one because I remember reading in the journals one day when I just had started a new job as an optometrist and I read this journal and it said, what uh, under correction actually can make your patients more myopic and I thought well that's good because I didn't even know that under correction was a possible way to slow myopia and I hadn't been doing it at all so uh, but some people habitually left their patients 050 075 under corrected and hoped that that would stop them becoming more myopic and we know that actually that may have made the eye longer and the myopia progress quicker so bifocals, these were proposed on the idea that it was accommodation that led our patients to become myopic. And the, the use of these lenses has generally been found to be fairly ineffective. That is, unless your patient is, has a near ESO and a, 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 an accommodative lag. So if you've got those patients in your practice, then pro pro progressives or bifocals actually can be very effective. So in animal studies, Refractive development is guided by optical defocus. The refractive development is dominated by retinal mechanisms and it doesn't actually even need a visual signal to leave the eye. It doesn't need a sympathetic or parasympathetic input and an intact fovea is not required for emetropization. So really we can assume from a lot of that work that it's the peripheral retina that's playing a big part in that. So this work was carried out by Earl Smith in Houston, Texas, and he showed that the rays hitting the peripheral retina control axial length growth. So here, we can see here that we've got a, a corrected myope <clears throat> and that the fovea is now, the rays are now in focus at the fovea, but out into the periphery, the image shell goes behind the retina. If you undercorrect them, so back to our undercorrection theory, you're now out of focus at the fovea, but you're still keeping this peripheral image shell in the uh, outside of the retinal plane. So why does ortho-K control myopia progression? Well, the answer is the strange optic that it forms in the periphery. What you find is that the fovea is now receiving in-focus rays, but the peripheral retina, the image shell, has now moved inside the retina. So we no longer have that image shell sitting outside. And that's because we form this strange topography map. We have this central area, which is now in focus for the patient's eye, this steep area here, and, and we've got an increase in spherical aberration, and that's what moves the, that image shell. Uh, we know from studies, this is the first one published back in 2005, that we really do find that there's a slowing of progression of myopia in patients who are fitted with ortho-K. But the questions that come along are, are, and are still being answered is, does the effect last? Is there going to be a point where it's going to spring back for our patients and they're suddenly going to become minus six from being minus two? Um, is there a particular age that you need to start or a particular age that you need to stop? And again, that's a question that we probably still need work to answer. And how to make it work for everyone. 
sometimes these patients will be fitted with ortho-K and their myopia will still progress, where a child with very similar baseline measurements won't progress at all. So how can we make that effect happen for everybody? And also a lot of these studies came out from the Far East where that rate of myopia is much higher, so we need to be absolutely sure that it works for Caucasian eyes. And actually now we can say that that's absolutely true. So here we are, this was the results that came out with American children, Caucasian eyes. So does the effect last? That really is the, the big question. And, and I think at the moment it's something that does mean that we have to, we have to watch this space a little bit. I think the future will be shaped by research. The, future will the research will tell us about all the answers to all those questions, but what it'll also allow us to do is to create very specific optics for that individual. So it will be specifically determined aberrations rather than a lens that's there uh, just as a standard lens for all patients. But I think that we do need to take action now for our patients. We need to give our patients and their parents information that allows them to make a choice about are there options available for them now to help prevent their uh, myopia progressing? Because a 12-year-old who's minus two now can't wait 15 years for the research to come out because it's most likely if they have two myopic parents that they're going to be minus six or even higher by the time they reach 18. Um, I think we should have some written info in our practices. I think we should, we should form our own opinion. And I think we need to look at the research and we need to take advice from professionals who work in that field. And we need to have something that we can hand out to our patients and their parents. Um, we, need to we need to include in that, for the very young children, about the outdoors effect. Um, pa patients and their parents can visit myopiaprevention.org because there's a lot of discussion about um, the different methods of myopia prevention. It, it goes in to say why some of them are outdated and why we no longer consider them to be current and also talks about the current options. So I think that what we really have to say is that we can't guarantee any results for any child, but we really shouldn't use that as a reason not to give advice at all. Ortho K is the best alternative that we have available for, the, uh, for our children in the UK. But actually, I think that we have to tie that in with the fact that children get enormous benefits from ortho -K. They don't have spectacles that they're going to break at school whilst playing sports. Their parents don't have to worry that they're going to drop a contact lens on a rugby pitch, put it in their mouth and stick it back in their eye. Um, and they get that freedom from spectacle wear because for children, sometimes it can still be really debilitating to be the one child in your class who has specs or who has to do something else for sports. So I think that we still need to choose ortho -K for all the other optical reasons and lifestyle reasons that we would normally choose ortho -K, but particularly for children, include information about myopia prevention because I think that it can make a really big difference for, uh, for the children. And on that note, any questions? Oh. oh. Part of this, for my patients, is something that will stop with myopia, or is it just they don't have to wear contacts? So when I send the literature out to my patients. When you send the literature, oh, sorry, the question is, I'm moving back, I'm moving back, I'm moving back. The question is, um, do we promote this in our practices as a myopia prevention system, or are we promoting it as ortho-K on its own? And I think the, the, the answer to that would be, in the, practice, in the practice that I worked in, I think you'd have to include information from both sides. I think that you need to be choosing ortho-K because it offers all the other benefits as well, but include that there is information that shows that it can slow myopia prevention. I think we're a little way away from being able to sell it as a solely myopia. Pro progression prevention. But I think we do need to include the information in there. Are you, are you going to produce some research? Yeah, I, I think in the next few months that we'll have, we, I think the research now is much more definitive and that we can include something now that we can help you have written information to give out. So I think in the, in the coming months that we'll definitely have something that's available for you. We already have a lot of literature available for children because I think it's a good market for ortho -Kay. I think they're the people that get the really, really big benefits from it and I think absolutely will include some myopia prevention advice in there as well. How do you find children tolerate the lenses and what age would you start them? My, my youngest patients in practice uh, that I fitted were uh, seven and nine brothers. They sail really seriously, even at that age. And <laughs> I say they were seven and nine. They're now like, much taller than me and 15 and 17 or something. Um, 
but they sail very seriously. They really do consider themselves as possible candidates for the Rio Olympics. So they are very serious sailors and spectacle, uh, spectacles just didn't work for them. And even contact lenses were too unstable. The kind of sailing that they do is quite, you know, high seas adventures. Um, and so they have really enjoyed all the benefits of ortho -K. Their myopia hasn't progressed at all in that period. So they're fantastic patients. I think it does depend an awful lot on the child. You have to weigh up their ability to handle the lens, whether you think they're going to be washing their hands properly. Um, all the research shows that kids are really, really compliant as long as they get enough reminders. So each time you see them for a visit, you remind them about all the things they should and shouldn't be doing. And you ask them what they're doing, not ask their parents. And I, I think you have to, even at seven, hand over the responsibility to the patient, not to their parents. Because I think as, when they own that responsibility, they tend to be much better at it. Because I remember as a child totally ignoring all the nagging that my parents gave me. So it's better, I think, to build up a nice relationship where they're doing it because they, they think it's the right thing to do. Excuse my ignorance. Also, be used for anything else but my open. Um, most systems for ortho -K are myopia, so they're sort of minus 0.75 through to minus 4.50. Uh, we, we don't have a system for plus. There is a system out there for plus, but it's limited to about plus two, which obviously for the majority of people is going to be a relatively um, non-existent market because most plus twos can accommodate for it. But. And the astigmatism, is in, the ranges are increasing. I think you can get up to about minus 2.50 with the rule seals now, so... Minus, minus four with a minus 250 seal gives you quite a big range. Thank you very much. Enjoy the rest of your conference and do come along for our show tomorrow. We've got some very good speakers. Eve van der Warp in the morning, um, Caroline Burnett Hodd at lunchtime, and we have Jim Kirshner from Synergize coming to talk to us about the ultra health in the afternoon break. So come here early, get your front seats, teas and coffees. We'll see you tomorrow.